additional talking if possible. The, the, the whole purpose is, is to hear from you all. So, um, with that, you saw, and, and as a reminder, I think you've probably already seen this, but for all the groups, um, those exact same priorities, the, the, the goal of the priorities that were up on the slides that are on there, that are, Um, we not yet, but I, I, thank you. Are you volunteering? <laughs> we have one of our neighbors actually. Who okay. had, had, at some point, before since we yeah. are hydrologists, but I mean, there's a number of people in town, right? Yeah. There's actually a volunteer group that goes around doing free volunteer hydrology type stuff for towns. So. Yeah, yeah. It's already out there. So I, I should, I should, I um, show you. Is the microphone yeah. showing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Just so, folks. Okay. okay. Was, do we have uh, hydrology volunteers, that sort of thing? Uh, yes. So I, my answer of not yet was a little bit too truncated, probably. Um, I, I should say there are two folks in particular on the commission and in this working group, Ned being one of them, who even, I'm not sure hydrology, who are very much experts in, in this in this category. Um, and we have begun reaching out to other experts. And, and certainly the, the plan of the commission going forward is, is to do exactly as you're suggesting. So. Yes, they're there. Um, so while I say no, I also mean yes. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that I hope I'm making sense, folks. Yeah, and I guess yeah. the second part of that was uh, on the scientist side. Is there a, the average geologist or somebody? I was wondering because I was in the microphone. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Is that on? Sorry. Geologist or somebody who knows the the region around here well in geology because um, I, I don't know but I, I I've been involved in energy in the past and I know for instance here in New York we have large underground storage facilities for gas for New York City and I'm wondering whether there's some salt domes or some domes underneath here that could be used uh, as a storage facility, which are sometimes pretty substantial. Sure, sure. Um, I, a similar answer to the first one, which is the commission will certainly be reaching out to those types of groups. I should also note, folks, that it's not the commission, um, and, and any of my colleagues, please, Ned in particular, please feel free to jump in, but the commission, um, our, our, it's not our goal, and it's not a realistic goal for the commission itself to become the leading expert in the state on these topics. What, where we are, what we can do in this watershed management is to ensure that the various groups who are working in this field are talking to one another, you know, to, to connect the dots, get smarter ourselves certainly, and tap into the exactly kind of experts you're talking about, but also to to make sure that all the parts are playing together and, and connected. I, I hope that makes sense. Ned, do you have any? Ned is one of our experts yeah. in watershed management. So. I'm involved in watershed management, and uh, but I'm not a I'm not a hydrologist or a geologist per se. I'd love to talk with you more. Um, one thing I would say though is that there is a process underway right now. So already in across the state in the highly affected areas, there's work going on to uh, bring in contracts and to bring in hydrologists to do an initial look see at uh, really particularly high prominence opportunities to uh, do floodplain restoration projects and to uh, reduce flood damage impacts in some of the communities that have been most highly damaged, uh, Berlin and Barrie and Middlesex and Montpelier and right on up to the watershed. So that, that process is going on in this area and also up in Johnson and Ludlow and other hard hit areas. And out of that will come a cluster of you know most likely prominent opportunities and then the commission and the public will be involved in thinking about which ones can really move and uh, where to put uh, additional money uh, to work up more uh, specific plans about uh, what could be done in terms of acquiring and changing situations to restore floodplain functions so a lot of that is in process um, and we look forward to having that happen it will take time to one, come up with a big schematic, which is likely to take until the fall at least. And then after that, there'll be a process of looking at that and saying, well, these are a whole bunch of really good ideas, but you know, we got to start somewhere and chase the money we have and begin picking away at it and continue that process. So that's kind of where we're at with that. Other thoughts, questions? Uh, yes.
How's this? Good. Hi, my name is Paul Markowitz. I live here in Montpelier. Um, comments and a question. One is, as you can see, like from this gentleman, I think there's a wide range of expertise that exists in Montpelier. And my hope is that this commission taps into that expertise. I understand that's the plan for the long range. It's not just communication, but how can we engage? How can we involve and bring these folks all the, all the expertise? People are itching and really want to get involved. And this is a critical issue. So I hope that's the long-term plan, expanding the universe of folks that are actively involved in, in making the change. Um, the other one is a comment and a question, and that is around planning versus action. And I love that the commission's already gone ahead and identified uh, like a concrete opportunity at the place near the uh, near Agway. Um, and I also hope, and I, this is the question part, that there's a long-term, that the, the goal is to develop a long-term plan for the entire watershed in terms of flood mitigation. I don't know exactly what exists, but it seems to me that would be an ideal task for this group to look comprehensively at the range of um, actions that can be taken to reduce reduce flooding. And so maybe that's the question part. Hopefully that's part of this. So thank you. I can take a little bit of a stab yeah. at that, and yeah. that is that the scoping assessment that Ned just referred to will be kind of guided by Vermont Emergency Management, and they've secured some funding from FEMA, I believe, through the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program to do the scoping assessment up and down the Winooski, identify a range of projects, um, and try to calibrate them and say, how much will this reduce the flood risk, and what are the benefits, and what are the drawbacks? We see the Commission's role is once that um, analysis gets done, and it will be done, I believe, in part, perhaps even by Jose's neighbors, um, that uh, the commission can help make sure everyone in the community is aware of those, gets a chance to weigh in. We can all together balance, okay, we're gonna have to give this up, but we're gonna gain this, and let's see what we can do about building a consensus around moving some of those forwards. Because some of these projects are gonna be tough. We're gonna have to give up something in order to gain some future resilience. So how do we best educate people and bring them in? Ned, you. Did you have something you wanted to add, Ned? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. Um, well, I had a question twofold. One is like resources. We know that the Regional Planning Commission has done a lot with Watershed. I've been on one of their committees. And so they can really be very helpful. And likewise, as far as dam removal, which we have four non-functioning dams that really need to be removed. And several years ago, the state did a report recommending them, but it's very costly because of the toxic behind the dams. So my question is how soon, let's say I feed you that report. Is there any way that the commission can start acting to give the state momentum this legislative session? <laughs> I mean, when do you act on any of this? Is this a review process that you go with publicly and they endorse your actions, or do you just decide and do it? We have a little uh, just kind of proactively knowing that it's very much in line with all the goals that um, I was talking about tonight. So there is a piece of legislation that's moving right now um, there hopefully will be a vote tomorrow through the Senate Natural Resources Committee up at the State House that does include um, river corridor regulations, wetland regulations, and dam. And it invests in the dam safety program at ANR and funding for dam removals. And so we're like, uh, I know Ben, on our behalf as the chair, has testified in that committee, kind of sharing the story. And part of it has been like trying to build the urgency is kind of the role the commission has identified as let's let's keep talking to them and reminding them why that kind of legislation needs to move and why they need to put money into it. So that's so we, we've played that role so far, trying to support that legislation that has that damn piece in it. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, well, yes, it does. But if you actually read this report, report says Montpelier is the most vulnerable city in Vermont due to these four dams. I mean, quote the state, the state's words. Let, let's do that. <laughs> Yes, email it to me. <laughs> I had a question on the dams. What, what, what's, what's that again, sir? She had asked about your 
Yeah. Ned, did you want... Here, come, Ned, Ned, come to the microphone. Or... Come, Ned, come, Ned, come to the microphone. <laughs> Yeah, we, we don't have any funding or authority in and of ourselves. So all we can do is advocate on behalf of the people of Montpelier and in the watershed that these are important priorities to be picking away at. And we need leaders and particularly people that can help move projects. And indeed, we're looking for people that do have an interest in making things happen. So um, one of the things that really matters is when there's a, a project that's important and there have been many studies and, and many great ideas for the city of Montpelier in terms of flood resilience in the past and uh, they've come up with long laundry lists of things that could be done and they're not done and that's because somebody needs to step forward and, and be the champion the captain the person that's going to bird dog it and we need lots of bird dogs so you know this is where the community really kind of makes the difference and pushes the commission and works with the commission works with pushing the legislature and all the different pieces. Where is the bottleneck to make things happen? So yeah, there's a lot of room for uh, making all these things happen. And we don't have the authority to make anything happen, but there's a lot of bottlenecks, one of which is money. And then the, the landowners need to say it's a good idea. And it takes time and it takes a lot of engineering and a lot of work. So all these things, but we need to work away at it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, just adding right on to the discussion of the dams. And I think that it's vitally important that this commission just come out and very clearly say that they support the removal of the dams. I don't know that that has been clear in the materials and the positioning. Um, I think in the same way, uh, you know, of having a press conference and supporting the bringing back the post office, like just saying that, like, yes, we want to remove the dams. Like, let's not get to the question of if that is that, that that's been answered. Let's get to the question of how we're going to do it, how we're going to get the funding and to be able to do it. And I think that my understanding the process in we're right now, I mean, the the Rivers uh, Coalition has sort of put out an RFP and there's a study going on about, you know, removing the dams. And, you know, I think their last comments to city council about that process was, oh, maybe we'll remove the dams, like if this report um, sort of yields that as a re recommendation. Um, and I think it's just, you know, important to get our entire legislative state and federal delegation on board to say like, yes, like <laughs> we're gonna remove these dams of Montpelier and any of these dams that are in the same category in the state of Vermont and just say like, we're gonna do it. And I think that will help tremendously in driving the very extensive permitting process um, and whatever you know, and funding process that ensues down the board. But to this point, I don't think I have seen that forceful, clear like decision that like, yes, we're going to remove these. It's just a matter of how we're gonna do it. Uh, just an idea that would be a suggestion about, as a 15-person commission, when you want to make a statement or a stand or maybe um, a vehicle that allows you to get public opinion quickly on things like that. So it's not you, it's the, it's the public saying, yeah, we want to remove the dams. And that could be a system, like as Ben has said, this long journey is going to be about systems in place. So perhaps a system that quickly polls the town on, on ideas and votes and is able to express an opinion. Thank you. Jared. Thanks, Jen. Hi, I'm Jared Duval. I just wanted to um, appreciate one of the priorities that's listed here um, in terms of promoting public understanding and support of watershed functions. Um, I'm somebody who is not an expert in watershed management, but I understand how important it is, and I know enough to understand that it's a very complex, nuanced um, area. And um, I think that if the timeline, in terms of some of the reports you were mentioning, Ned, and that have come up in terms of you know, some of that broader looking at opportunities will be towards the fall, and that when those decisions are coming up, they're gonna be, involve difficult trade-offs. Um, that before that, like in the spring and summer, just wanna lend support for um, having um, sessions, and I don't know what exactly what they would look like, maybe some site visits, maybe some presentations and discussions, so that um, those of us in town who aren't experts can benefit from some of the folks who are and the latest data and evidence, because I get the sense the more and more I hear about 
watershed management that sometimes things that sound obvious can have unintended consequences or have the reverse effect. So the more that we can kind of be up to speed and be as informed as possible in advance of some of those difficult decisions with trade-offs, we just very much support that. And thank you for identifying that as a priority. I love it. I have a question. I grew up on the North Branch. And when I was a child, they used to drain it periodically and clean out all the trash and just really clean it up. And lately, that hasn't happened. And I'm sure there's reasons for it. I'm just, again, I'm not an expert, so I don't know. But I also know that the North Branch is much shallower and it is filling in on the sides. So we're not, is it the man-made dams that need to go away to allow the river to flow the way it should to give it more resilience? I mean, is it, is it the human factor that's screwing up the, the North Branch? <laughs> Let's get our actual watershed expert. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a great question. Yeah, and, and so you're actually asking about the functioning of the North Branch and, you know, is it constrained in some way and is that a problem? And there's a whole nest of questions in there that come out of that. And and I, I like many people, have been out with uh, the, the church groups going up and down the river, hauling out shopping carts and tires and blocks of stuff that have been tossed into the river. And that's, you know, an ongoing chore up and down the roads of Vermont and the rivers of Vermont and North Branch as well. Um, and yeah, definitely there's, uh, you know, different, there's some grass that grows along the edge of the, of the, the North Branch, but that's, that's really not a big issue on the North Branch. It's mostly uh, a fairly rocky bottomed, you know, channel. Um, and, but, you know, the whole, the whole existence of Montpelier has been really in um, antagonism with the river, channelizing it, squishing it in, creating walls, and, and it's very much more of a conveyance. Oh, I think I just heard a bell. Um, so it's it's a, it's a problem of of thinking about water more broadly, and uh, that that's one of the many things we can think about together. But uh, it's probably not actually a big problem on the North Branch, though. Yeah. Okay. I just want to point out that if you if you'd like to, uh, Mark was just ringing the bell. If you would like to transition to one of the other working groups um, to hear from them as well, um, now is a good time to do that. And those other two rooms are just straight down the hall. They're the first two classrooms on the left as you go down the hall that way. Um, otherwise, you're welcome to stay here and, and continue the discussion with us here. <laughs> questions here if you want to take a look and make sure I got your question or suggestion down happy to have you do that yes yeah I, I okay. just want to congratulate you guys for the leadership you're taking I think it's crucially important the one thing that I would say is um, it was really smart to choose one place where you could have a quick early success at the that confluence and that you should be doing that sequentially and aggressively. And the question of moral of authority here, um, because you're leading and because you're representing the city and you're really representing the people, you have as much authority as you take in terms of rallying yeah. the public and engaging them to put their power on the line for project to project. Sometimes that's gonna mean political pressure, sometimes it's gonna mean communication. But all those studies from the past are all out there. You don't yeah. wait for somebody to do it and you don't study it again. You say, what's the priority thing that we're gonna do this next six months that we could line up around? And, and then you're engaging the power, you build trajectory and people will be with you and, and be leading for you. So. Yeah. And I think on that topic of authority and just sort of what we can do, I, this is my own, in my head, my personal view on this is that we, we are essentially there to ensure that resiliency has a seat at the table for all these discussions, where, where oftentimes it hasn't in the past. Um, or, and to make sure that when projects, that, like that list of projects on our resources page that have been floated in Montpelier before, eventually sort of die on the vine because the, the flywheel stops spinning, we're, we hope that the commission can play a part in making sure that that flywheel does not start spinning and ensure that the, the weight, we're also in a different time now. I mean, the, the, the floods, you know, the, the, the weight of what's happened, I think is on everyone's mind and it's the, the commission's 
position and job to make sure that that, that urgency, again, like it's a flywheel, that the urgency keeps spinning um, and make sure that those, th those thoughts are brought to all of these discussions. Uh, okay. any, any other uh, questions? Yes. Hi, my name is Kasha. I'm with Vermont River Conservancy, and this is in part response to the previous half conversation. Um, but I wanted to thank you first for um, recognizing that work that happens both upstream and downstream of Montpelier is critical to improving things in Montpelier. The reality is that this community is going to need to support floodplain restoration, river corridor easements that are outside the boundaries of this town wholeheartedly. Um, so really appreciate that. Um, the ho specifically, the home farm project came up, which I'm very excited to ha see happen. That's at the confluence of the, uh, the Upper Winooski and the Stevens branch. I think that that place would love to be a beautiful floodplain and wetland, and the home farm is critical to that. Um, and I would encourage the commission to also look more broadly at that, at the Casella's Waste site that is immediately adjacent, the UVM Records facility with significant parking lots that I see mostly unused adjacent to that facility. Um, there's also a gun club just across the way, and then a state-owned VTrans property that has flooded five times in the last 12 years. So I hope that the, all of those can be part of a broader wetland floodplain restoration that I suspect would have significant impacts here. Um, and then the dam, the dam feasibility studies came up in the last conversation. Our organization is leading that work right now. We are in the middle of the feasibility studies. They just started. It will take probably 12 to 18 months to complete the feasibility studies. And the intent, the hope, is to remove all four of these dams. They are owned by four different people, four different entities. They have different sediment behind them. We really want to move forward with implementation. That's the plan. That's why we're doing the studies. But it's not possible to do implementation without the studies. So we were working on this before the floods even happened. So the project is a bit accelerated in some ways. Um, and that's in process. And I think what we're going to need is the funding for the implementation and um, the community support be, to make sure that these have the, the political will to move forward. Kasha, would you mind yeah. mentioning what those four dams yeah. are? Yeah, um, so those four dams, I'll start right in downtown Montpelier. The most visible is the Bailey Dam, which is right next to Shaw's. Everybody knows right where that is. Just around the corner, under the pedestrian bridge where the North Branch comes into the Winooski, there's a very small dam, um, kind of locally known as the Rat Dam or the Trestle Dam. Um, that's already partially breached. If you go upstream on the Winooski, if you go past Bar Hill, past the veterinary clinic, if you walk the bike path um, out of town, there's a dam there, um, the Pioneer Street Dam, that probably has the, the most sediment and the most carcinogens in that sediment that's behind it. We're going to learn about what, what that is. And then again, upstream from that is a dam that's called Hidden Dam. It is, in fact, a little bit hidden. It's right at the base of U32 High School, um, and so that's the four four dams. Hi, my name is Steve Gold. I've lived on the North Branch since 1978. When the, when the depth of the water behind the Brightsville Dam was raised for power, to, to create a low head power plant, the dynamics in the North Branch changed dramatically. I have a drain in my basement that goes out to the river. That had never, the North Branch had never backed up so that water came into my basement prior to that the, the level in the um, Wrightsville Dam being raised. To say nothing of the fact that it wiped out a magnificent stretch of river that was used to be above the, right, the Wrightsville Dam and before you got to Putnamville. Um, so that's, that's one comment that I think that needs to be checked out, what the, what the uh, water level in Wrightsville is doing in terms of the dynamics of of the North Branch, especially as it fills up even higher with flood water. The second comment I have is <clears throat> that right now a very hot topic is what's going to happen to the Worcester Range. There's been all kinds of comments about that written. I just saw a very interesting 
um, report from um, the, the Conservancy uh, in, in uh, Natural Resources Council, rather, that endorsed the state plan for uh, timber harvesting in the Worcester Range. And there have been a lot of letters uh, vocalizing against that. Uh, my concern is that the efforts of the commission make sure that the, the issues of, of upstream and headwaters flood control is a, a seriously considered in, in the final version of that plan. That's one of the concerns I have. If they're exposing half acre open parcels all over the place, what's that's going to do to the drainage when we get these incredible deluges? Jan, do you want to? No, the microphone. Do you want to? <laughs> I was just going to say, Ned can probably fill in, but we believe that the um, Department of Environmental Conservation has requested some assistance from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to take a, right, take a look at Wrightsville and see how, if there are changes in the management that can happen there that might address some of all of our concerns. Thank you so much for all the work you're doing. I'm curious about individual action that people can take, and I don't recall seeing anything around stormwater management on individual properties. Is that something this um, working group will be doing? I think the short answer is yes, because it certainly fits with whether adaptive downtown watershed management, certainly that's a piece of it. Um, I, uh, what's that? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I, the short answer is yes. I, it's, it's, we're obviously early stages in, in, the, in the commission in terms of what that might look like, what, what, what efforts we can support or will support, that sort of thing. But thank you for bringing it up. And I, I, love, uh, what, I love what's being floated in this room because it, it, it's, it caps, you're capturing really the breadth of, of the challenges. And I, if you have more to your question, is there? Uh, I, really about what individuals can do because a lot of people are thinking okay yes a lot of things are going to take you know 12 months 18 months two months two years who knows how long but there are things I know that individuals can start to do especially on people who have larger parcels um, so having education around that I know there are ongoing projects that a lot of nonprofits are doing already, but having that be a little bit more targeted to individuals with parcels um, where water is actively flowing into the rivers and to the um, tribs would be something to look into. And that's another example where, um, you know, the Vermont River Conservancy and others, there are experts in the state working on exactly these kinds of issues, and that's where the commission, we're going to do our, our as best we can to help to bolster, amplify, connect those. And I love, I think what I was trying to say is that you brought up sort of personal property storm management issues. You brought up like head, you know, way, 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 the, right when the rain first falls on the highest peak. And I thank you for doing that because you guys are really encapsulating the breadth of what needs to be taken into account. And it's huge, but it's, it's, but there are experts out there working on this and there's more to be done and there are the connections to be made. But, but you're, you're really wonderfully capturing, I think, where the thought needs to go into the various places that water can be captured, slowed down, controlled a little bit better, knowing that we are going to get that water, and how can we reduce or, in some cases, you know, minimize, mitigate whatever the flooding that happens. So thank you. Um, I'm Becky McCullough, and I wanted to bring up uh, a similar thing about at, in the beginning when people were talking about what could do, what we could do. Um, Someone would routinely say, well, there are things that individual homeowners in town can do to slow the water down. We live up on the hill and we weren't flooded, but there was so much water coming down that we've lost a couple of trees. Mm -hmm. And so I'm planning on doing a water garden <laughs> in our house. You know, the things like that. So I, I would second that. And I was also wondering about how there were going to be connections made with other communities. Anyone on the connections piece? So again, on the on the home, on the individuals, I think that it's certainly on our radar to help again bolster, amplify those, and, and to, to the idea the idea of hosting um, 
learning events going forward. I think that that would certainly be a wonderful one. In addition to, you know, what's happening way out of eyesight for most people beyond the river corridors to, to help this issue. Um, what was the last piece of your thing? Sorry, the the. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the connections, yeah. James, I can take a crack yeah, at that. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Um, and one piece is through this um, scoping assessment that's going to be happening up and down the Winooski, those projects are going to be interrelated and hit a lot of different communities. So I think when once that report comes out and there are projects along there, we're going to be in communication with other communities around, okay, what do, you th what do we think is feasible? What do we think is doable? Maybe there's a short, mid, and long, um, long range plan around that. I think it may be, well, the, uh, there aren't our kind of commissions in other towns. Some of that would happen through the Central Mount Regional Planning Commission, but I also want to highlight that Pat Moulton is here, um, and she works for the governor and is particularly tasked with Central Vermont Recovery and is working particularly with the communities of Barrie, Waterbury, and Montpelier, and she um, she's living that connection and connecting those. I don't know if there's anything you want to add, Pat. Thanks, Jen. Um, Hi, I'm Pat Moulton. I'm your Central Vermont Recovery Officer. I'm all things long-term recovery. Good to see so many familiar faces. Eventually, and I can't tell you when, we want to convene a river corridor summit, if you will, of the communities, probably municipal leadership, um, maybe, I, I'm still thinking about what that's going to be, but when those communities have a better sense of what the actions are that they're going to take. I mean, Barry's looking at how can we reclaim floodplain, you're looking at that, trying to get a beat on what, where it's Marshfield, Cabot, Waterbury, etc. So that will be one venue for that sort of collaboration but i think jen's spot on central Mount regional planning commission will also be the scoping study will also be so it may take a bit but that will be happening another wonderful example where the experts and the work is being done and the commission i think is going to be playing the role of again amplifier connector doing our part to support bring to the table anything that w that isn't already there that can help these efforts uh, just some of the, the the individual comment about what individuals can do kind of prompted my this idea because we have a a big spring in our backyard and so when like we get a lot of rain there's a lot of water there and i don't know if that's something that needs to get collected for the bigger hole and or if there's something that you know you all would um recommend for us that have that kind of spring to yeah i don't know what you know, I don't know what it is, but now it's just running down and everybody's <laughs> springs are probably just running down. So I don't know if there's some kind of collection that that needs to happen. If that's a serious, if it's a serious like way that more water is getting into the system, I'm not sure, but I just thought about that. Ned, do you have any? Yeah, that's a, that's a great thing. I'd be interested to talk with you later. But um, groundwater is an important resource as well. And so springs and clean water are really important. There'll be times where Montpelier is looking at drought. And, and the functioning of our groundwater and access to it is going to be critical. So we have both sides of the coin to deal with here. Um, and so, and the flooding that comes into into our communities is not from springs per se, um, but we we do need to be mindful of water and how we manage it. And typically, we want it to be in the ground <laughs> uh, where we can and, and saturating the forests and saturating the soil structure and and taking a long time to come into the city so that we don't have it all arrive at the same time and do a lot of damage. So uh, really basically bending the curve, as we know, um, reducing the flow, having it all come asynchronously over time. And and so all of our places are, are good. You know, our springs are good places to think about water and groundwater and what's going on. When when your spring is running really heavy and the rain is coming, that's the scary point, you know, because the ground is saturated or frozen and we're much more susceptible to damage from overland flow. But um, your spring is not causing the flooding. It's okay. Hi, I'm Jack McCullough. Um, I want to mention that. Uh, for the last couple of years, the city's been working on developing a stormwater utility. And like many things, it 
kind of pause during the uh, post-flood time, but the idea is that for the city to handle and manage uh, stormwater and all the things we do with stormwater costs money. And so the stormwater utility is a way to uh, assess uh, the cost of those uh, stormwater according to uh, property and property characteristics and use that to, to generate funds that we will then use to do the capital project, big things like capital projects all the way down to little things like uh, street sweeping so the stuff doesn't, uh, so things don't get clogged up. And so that's in the works and uh, it continues to be a priority for us. And one of the benefits of doing a stormwater utility is you can structure it in a way that if you have good stormwater practices, kind of to your point, uh, you can get have reduced fees, I mean, depending on how you set it up. So it can be structured potentially to incentivize individual action to kind of reduce your impact on our water system. I'd, and I'd just like to compliment the city, actually. There's been some really wonderful communication coming out of the city in the past several several months about different activities. The one that really caught my eye, I don't know if you all saw it, it was a few months back, like maybe November, October, about the work on the water mains. And it was a detailed look at what those water mains were made of, the history of them, the work they're doing, why it's hard, what has to happen. My entire, for the past 25 years, my livelihood has been spent trying to communicate the topics of science and the environment to the rest of the world. I, I help scientists and engineers translate their work to the rest of the world, largely in sustainability, but other things too. And I read that post. It was sort of a master class in how to do it. It was really wonderfully done. And I compliment the city for, because I think that that's, that's the kind of Information and the way to get that information out that the commission is going to be taking to heart too, when with all of these complicated topics and making sure that very smart people in our community, you all, all of us who aren't trained in these topic areas, get this information in a way that it means something to us, we can understand and we can act on. So, I'm, in other words, the city's doing, I think, some wonderful things in that regard, and I hope the commit we the commission's plan is is to to do the same with these other topics. I apologize here. No, thank you. Um, I'm Zach Porter, and a, a resident here, like many or all of you. I'm the executive director of Standing Trees, which is a public land advocacy organization that works all over New England, but uh, spends a lot of time working on public land issues here in Vermont. And I want to thank the, the uh, gentleman who spoke about the importance of our headwaters and, and the Worcester Range, um, which is a huge decision uh, that the state has in front of it right now that we can have a significant impact on over the next uh, several months. Um, the Agency of Natural Resources is working on a management plan that will not just last the next 20 years, but really set in motion management for this landscape for potentially generations to come. And uh, this coming fall is when the final plan is expected to come out but there's you know there's there's time but not a lot of time for our community to speak out and uh, the towns of our surrounding towns haven't waited and it's great to see that Middlesex and Worcester have both both of their planning commissions and the conservation commission I believe in Middlesex have all uh, called for a pause they're all experiencing the same flooding of course that we are and so not only do I hope that we join our, our surrounding communities in calling for changes in state land management, but I also hope that we might think about, if we haven't already, just something that came to me a moment ago, I don't know if this is already under consideration, but why not partner with the communities around us um, to actually pool resources to protect more wetlands to you know protect more headwaters um, if we're not already talking about that you know montpelier is small right that's one of our greatest challenges we don't have the tax base to do a great many things that we would like to do in this town um, let's let's join you know forces with the communities around us but um, i do hope that the city leadership and this commission will use the pedestal that you have to speak out for changes in this worcester range management unit long range management plan the comment period uh, closed on the draft plan on February 2nd, but that should not stop anybody in city leadership from speaking out. Just today, FPR, Fish and Wildlife, were in front of the House Environment and Energy Committee testifying on their draft plan, and there's time to make a huge difference at the State House and with uh, ANR. So anyways, um, thank you to the Commission for the great, the great work that you're doing and for this forum today. Thanks, Zach. Who's next? 
So the others are gonna join us back here in about eight minutes for our closing sort of piece on this evening. So any, any other uh, questions, comments, ideas, things you want us to be thinking about, people you want us to know about? Any other, yeah. Hi, I'm Dick Muller from uh, here in town. And um, to help with the um, woman's question in the back about how homeowners can be helped. When the site visits happen, you were talking you were talking about going on site visits up and down the river. If people, um, if there were um, uh, wetland specialists there, plant specialists that could help people, give them ideas on right on the spot what they could plant. Maybe they've got enough willow around so they could cut some more and put it in their fields, but get to work on it. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> Lauren, do you want to break on that again? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, I'm wondering, um, Front Porch Forum seems to be a very active um, site of conversations about all these issues and about the work of the commission. Um, and fairly often, things seem to come up on Front Porch Forum like, oh, why not you know, dredge the rivers or do this or do that? Um, it's the kind of thing I think it might be helpful. Um, you know, I tend to... Um, respond to some of these things from the extremely adjacent perspective of a spouse or somebody involved in this, but I don't actually know what I'm talking about most of the time. And <laughs> the um, and I think it would be really helpful if uh, people on the commission um, could be, particularly those interested in communication, could be actively monitoring this stuff and responding to it um, really quickly from a, from a position of knowing what you're talking about and having um, some um, credibility on, on the issue and explaining, well, this is, you know, yes, there is somebody, you know, there, there is land available for um, floodplains, even though a cynical person posting said that will never happen. Or um, yes, really, there is, um, you know, it's really a very bad idea to dredge the rivers and this is why. So I just would encourage that kind of, um, you know, sort of monitoring um, what's going on, at least on that piece of social media and responding very quickly with some expertise. Thank you. We've got time for, yes. On the lane shops, I guess it's a bridge. The thing that, the, the bridge, there was a lot of debris that had built up there for years and it was there, it was there, it was there. And then after the flood, it was at the Spring Street Bridge blocking it and that caused a lot of the flooding. Is there something that we can do to make sure that the debris that flows down river doesn't kind of get caught up and then cause a problem later on? Ned, do you wanna, or Laura, sorry. I was just gonna say, I know that that issue has been raised, for example, to our great central Vermont recovery officer um, of how, you know, in particular, it's the kind of thing that we need state help to do and support. So looking for how we can bring those resources um, kind of a, on an ongoing basis. And is there a way for, you know, towns could then share machinery or things that it takes to clean up that debris. So that idea is definitely being explored. I hope, <laughs> but it's, it's, but it's being raised for sure. So yeah, thanks for raising that, it's important. I just had a question, I don't see Kasha anymore, but she mentioned the four dams on the main branch of the Winooski, but I know there's a bunch of dams along the north branch, other than that very first one by Shaw's. So I, I'm wondering where that fits in, in terms of affecting the river and dam removal potentially. Was that Ned, do you know the status of any of those? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the Lane Shops has a, has a dam there by the pedestrian bridge, which uh, I live right next to. Um, and uh, so it's a problematic dam. Um, it, it does, uh, you know, it was created for the, some of the first industries, you know, uh, water power in the city and the lane shops, which went on later with the advent of coal to become a foundry. Uh, so it's a historic 
feature. It's also very problematic. The owner would love to sell it if you would like to buy it for a dollar. Um, and there's a big insurance risk to this. <laughs> um, and it's hard to maintain, and it's really can't make any money from hydroelectric power off of it. So it's, it's a real problematic thing. It's also um, a dam where a lot of people love the feature of the pond behind it because they're used to that. And so it's very scary for people uh, that are trying to talk about uh, restoring aquatic movement of fish and habitat up and down the rivers and reducing the flood risk on the North Branch to even stir the pot of talking to the neighbors. <laughs> so I think that's one of the biggest problems. Um, but it may be the sort of thing that, uh, you know, when it blows out, and causes a huge deposit in the North Branch and it back up and chokes up downtown, we may decide it's all going at that moment. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, it's just, it's just, it's a very tricky place for people to get into politically fraught. Um, but it might have some value. During the peak of the flooding, I was up on the pedestrian bridge and you could see the water backed up behind the dam and then there was like a six inch difference between that and the water that was backing up from the Winooski. So um, it, 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 what's that? You could, you could just, yeah, you could canoe right over it, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess I'm just not sure how much flood, uh, it, it's, not, it's not in and of itself causing damage to structures upstream of the dam. Um, but if it blew out, it would, be, it would be a big problem downstream of the dam. I think one more, and then the other groups are about to join us. I think um, this is this is um, this is about about the dam. The um, people living adjacent to the dam um, actually had an informal agreement with the person who owns it, the dam by the the lane shops, um, five years ago, um, which would at the least have involved a transfer of ownership and responsibility of some of the property. Um, but when we tried to um, comply with the city requirements for making this transfer of property happen, um, we hit a point where we were told that we had to get a survey of all of the properties involved, um, that it might cost something like $12,000, um, and that the surveyors were not confident at all, given the um, amount of bodies of water involved, that they could actually do a survey. And at a certain point, after working very hard on this for about two years, I kind of threw my hands up, because by, by that time, everybody else had kind of given up. And I was like, well, I give up, too. But this was the situation where the city could have, and actually still could, um, take some action to assist in this process. And that might um, help solve part of the issue about the dam. So I would be grateful to hear from anybody about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So folks, as you've seen, the other folks are joining us. We're going to have a little bit of a closing session um, to wrap things up, announce what's sort of coming down the pike as well. But I just want to thank, for those of you in the room, um, and those of you coming into the room, thank you very much uh, for your, your feedback, your questions, your ideas. Um, we have been noting them down. They've been noted down in the other rooms. They're, they remain, they will remain to the end of the evening. Post-it notes at the back of the room if there are any ideas or thoughts or questions or resources that you want to continue to float um, because those will go to use in the commission I promise you and we um, and just again thank you and know again that this is this is the first this is the beginning of our, our communication to a communication with you not sort of a, a pinpoint along the way and <laughs> absolutely not the end of, the, of it along the way so thank you very much we'll wait for the other folks to come back in and then I think our fearless leader um, Ben will will uh, take us into the closing of the evening